episode eight, uh, which is really, really exciting. Today, we welcome Amy Jackson, who is, well, she's currently studying for a PhD, and she has a company called Oxtail, which specializes in communications, issue management, and we're going to be touching on welfare, uh, what it means, what it means for the consumer, and what it means for the farmer as well. Yeah, definitely an interesting one today, Bex. Welfare, as we find out in this episode, it means different things to different people. And that can cause a lot of different problems and challenges. And I really found this one interesting. So uh, thank you, Amy, for joining us today. We're going to be talking a bit about animal welfare and your life and kind of where you are now and, and how that, well, kind of what you're doing for welfare and, and public perceptions as well. So okay. um, our first question is, how did you yourself get into agriculture and where did the interest stem from? OK, that's that's an interesting one because I don't come from a farming background. Um, my my parents are actually in art. Um, but I always wanted to be a vet. So when I was 14, I was starting my Duke of Edinburgh Bronze Award and I was trying to find a vet surgery nearby. I could do my practical experience, but I was just down the road from an agricultural college. So I went up there and first day, absolutely smitten with agriculture. So I ended up um, helping out during lambing, going up in the summer, uh, going to the Royal Highland Show, helping them show their cattle, um, milking, creosoting sheep pens, the whole lot. So from there, that that was it. That that was the change in my life. I think it's really, really interesting that you've come from obviously not a farming background. Like I'm exactly the same. And I kind of find that if you don't come from a farming background, you sometimes kind of fall into it. It just kind of happens. I- and then you, fall, you you either fall in love with it or you don't. I think so. And I think it kind of almost is like a piece of jigsaw that just fits and you suddenly go, that's that's what I'm meant to be doing. And yeah, I think it's 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 difficult because I think when you start out, you sometimes feel it's a big disadvantage because you're surrounded by people who have lived and breathed farming and they've grown up in it. But I think um, now it's it's far more accessible. I think that people feel that if you come from outside farming, you can sometimes bring something different, different perspectives. So yeah, I like the way the industry's opened up. I think it used to be harder, but now I think it's increasingly easier and, and, and more and more people from outside are welcomed in. Yeah, that's, that's definitely... something we're trying to do, isn't it, Bex? <laughs> we're both going to say the same thing there. <laughs> yeah, we were. And I think it's such an important point that you make that people from outside the industry can bring something different. And whether that's I don't know, something more business minded or a new way of working, you know, people are more willing to, to bring something to change and, and hopefully improve the sector. So, yeah, I think it's a really good thing. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well, you know, it's becoming really, really important now. And, and I'll, I'll probably talk about this at some point in the, in, in the next half hour or so, but really important to um, embrace and understand what people think externally because they're our customers so I think sometimes as well you have a different perspective of of how that might come across if you come from outside the industry yeah no definitely so my question for you then is why cows and dairy because I'm not gonna lie when I first started in the industry I thought a cow was a cow you know you just I didn't realize that you know generally speaking your black and white cows are the cows that you milk and the brown cows are for meat. So why did you go down the dairy route? Yeah, interestingly, again, I um, w- when I started um, working at, when I was 14 and, and working on this college farm, I then uh, went to do some lambing at a farm. And I went in when I when I um, I did lambing for a few years and they had beef cattle, they had sheep. And I always thought that would be um, where where I would go but um, I was all lined up before I went to college to go to a beef and sheep farm for a year and that fell through and so I ended up answering an advert in Farmers Weekly and I ended up I, I grew up in Scotland and it was all in Scotland I was going to college in Scotland and I ended up going down to Lambourne um, in Berkshire um, which <laughs> which was a farm basically run by students pretty much or, or students provide all the labour but it had a farm shop so it had a dairy herd it had pigs it had sheep it had um, laying hens uh, we, we we had game birds for the, the shop in the winter um, so I then really really sort of fell in love with dairy farming because they had 200 cows and uh, we used to process the milk and I just loved the interaction with dairy cows because in a way they're 
they're less wild they're more domesticated they're more sort of reliant on you in a way and you have yeah. that daily interaction with them and I, I just yeah I really really loved dairy farming and also the fact that you can change something and you can see the result that day whereas with sheep and, and, and beef cattle and other other um you know I mean I suppose laying hens are the same as you can do something and see the results straight away whereas the longer term uh things are cropping um beef and sheep you have to wait and see that kind of effects coming down the line but I love the responsiveness of, of dairy farming as well and the responsiveness of the cows to whatever you do and also the fact that you can make a massive difference as well in calf rearing with how you rear calves with care and you know they respond well to that so I think there's a lot you can do in dairy farming to change the animals lives on a daily basis. I think that's something which maybe people underestimate it's not just oh there's a cow, you give it some food and it produces milk. Dairy cows are some of the most well looked after animals that you'll, that you'll ever come across because for exactly the reason you said, small changes make a massive difference to effectively how happy the cows are and then how much milk they produce. So I think, yeah, they're an amazing, I don't know myself much about dairy. We, you know, we're more um, on, the, on the sheep and arable side, but it's an amazing sector with so much to it. So I do take my hats off to anybody, you know, to, to people who live and breathe dairy and have to engage in those small changes literally every day um, to, to keep the cows happy. But you have that relationship with the cows as well, which I think you, you can have a close relationship. I mean, I'm not saying someone with beef cattle doesn't have that, but you do have a, a real working relationship with the cows, um, your co-workers, really, which I think I, I quite enjoy. I love Definitely. that. That's all about connections and, um, yeah, building that that connection with an animal. And um, I like that you said it's like co-workers, you know, you're a team. I, yeah, that's really interesting. Mm, definitely, definitely a nice way of thinking about it um so amy you're currently mm. studying for a phd um can you tell us more about this and again probably another interesting mm. qu question if anybody wanted to look into the research side of agriculture because it's not just somebody standing in a field there's a lot behind it and a lot of knowledge that we still need to find out and, and look into yeah definitely and um i mean i think the first thing i want to say is that when I when I started out, I did an HND because I felt I had a lack of practical knowledge, even though I worked on farms. So I started off with quite a sort of um, at a very practical level. And then what happened is I through my career, I've got more interested in some aspects. So I, I've always been able to go back to do a master's and I'm doing a PhD to, to look at what I'm interested in. So I think that's what's good is it's really accessible. You can you can study anything at any stage and you know you can start very practical but you can go and do something far more research-based if you want mm -hmm. so the second thing is um that this isn't just about animal science because I'm looking at social science so I'm understanding what public perceptions are of um dairy farming so uh one of my kind of I do a lot of issues in crisis management and communication that's 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 how I've moved into in agriculture so I've dealt with issues like antibiotic use in farming and so on and help the industry to manage its response uh, both in changing what it does and how it communicates that to the outside world so one of the things I'm particularly interested in is is public perceptions of like large-scale farming or modern farming and, and why people feel uncomfortable with it so this PhD opportunity came up sponsored by HDB so it was a great great opportunity and it's to really understand how we can communicate differently but also how we can change what we do because at the end of the day we're not in the same position we were 10 years ago where um, vegan foods and alternative foods were not very palatable, were very expensive, and people yeah. didn't really like them. Now we have a huge range of different foods which are affordable and palatable. We also have a lot of pressure from outside about how we farm, about attention to welfare, about the environment. So I think increasingly we have to make people feel good about their choices to consume animal products, about beef and meat and, and dairy. And that's what I'm interested in is how we can do that, how we can listen better and respond in a way which does the right thing by the animals as well. So I think um, th that's what's great. Is it's not just animal science. It's pe people understanding. There's a whole range of different things we can do now that sort of encompass the whole area of farming and food production. 
Definitely. And we, well, Lizzie and I talk about it a lot and we've talked about it in previous episodes, the idea of farmers being transparent and farmers, yeah. we still have a job to do to tell the public and, you know, we need to shout about what we do because we're, we're good at our jobs, you know, we're good at looking after our animals. And in some sense, if, if we don't tell people that they can't necessarily walk onto a farm and see, oh, do you know what? Those cows are happy. We have to be really open about what we do, how we do it, and why that's good for the animals, but as kind of a secondary, I guess, what it's good for the environment and, and, and all around, we're doing a good job, basically. Definitely. I mean, I think, I think we have to um, listen as well, though. I think we have to understand what people think. And sometimes people don't like things we do. And I think we then have to take a step back and say, are we doing the right thing? Um, if we want the public to support what we do. But um, I think it's about always being open minded. But also what I found in my research is that um, people's views is it's a bit like social media. It's easy to form a view when you're forming a mass view about a big entity and it's depersonalized. You say, oh, this is what happens in farming. Um, but when you actually know a farmer or you understand a farmer's story, suddenly you understand what they're doing and you have far more sympathy for them. So. For example, um, in a bit of research I'm doing now where I'm trying to understand different views of how we keep dairy cows, um, people are really against kind of what they see as big corporate farming. Mm -hmm. But then when they've seen a documentary on TV or they've met somebody who actually is really passionate about their cows, even if they're in quite a big farm, they feel far more sympathetic towards them. So the farmer's stories are really, really important because they personalise it and they show it's not some sort of big horrible thing going on it's actually a person who wants to do the right thing by the animals or has the same ambitions as them so the personal stories are so important in in forging that sort of gap between the public and farming so in terms of getting these kind of personal stories out there i mean often people are really using social media um and i see loads of people on twitter and instagram who are very open about their stories um but i guess not everybody can get that following quickly or you know it sometimes as i said it takes a while so how can farmers share their story and kind of become a, a real person almost i think it's just keeping doing it i mean i think people also get quite put off because they might get a real pushback um from people who feel very strongly about their vegan views um but I think in that case I mean especially on um Twitter I think you're you're now more able to manage who can re reply to your um your your tweets or your posts and I think it's important to probably do that because you know there are people who will just go on there and just be negative and just be rude and offensive and it can be very demoralizing so I think where possible, use a medium where you can minimise that happening. Um, if people do start having a go, just block them. It's just not yeah. worth getting into that because that's that's what they get up in the morning for. Um, so be it. Just block them. And I think don't get put off. Just just share um, share challenges as well. I mean, always be aware of, of what can come across and people might lose some of the understanding and, and misinterpret what you're saying. But I think that sharing a story, sharing challenges, sharing how you want to make a difference and how you want to improve things is always good and in my wider job um, which is all sort of issues management um, this this is what I find time and time again it's not what happens um, so much or if you make a mistake or something goes wrong it's about showing that you want to be accountable for it you want to own that issue and you want to change it and that's what people really want to hear they want to share your journey and I think people just need to start modestly build confidence, find what works. Obviously, a lot of visual audio stuff works well as well. Um, and people like to see farmers in particular interacting with animals. That's something yeah. they want to feel that farmers care. So show them that you care, show them how you're making your animals lives better and how you relate to your animals. That's what they want to see as well. That, that's all I can kind of offer on that. But I think I think it's just don't don't try and achieve it all in one go. Just keep trying different things. But take tentative steps and don't sort of go too full out always think about how your posts might be perceived as well just to avoid yourself getting into trouble I mean have you faced any kind of backlash on social media from any of your work or what you've done yeah sometimes I mean I always I always try and be really objective and uh informative um but also firm uh, when people talk rubbish um sometimes they do especially around antibiotics they can talk a lot of rubbish so I always push back but if people are you can tell whether you're engaging with someone who wants to engage and wants to have a discussion or you can tell whether they're just 
wanting to you know have a go so if that happens I just usually block them and I always say you know I'm sorry we're not going anywhere with this conversation on I'm I'm going to back out of this and then I just block them I just think it's very easy to let this stuff get to you um but mm-hmm. um I think it's always about being polite um but also recognizing where it's going nowhere and not expending any more energy than you have to you can it, these things can take entire days so uh, best to know where to draw the line I think Definitely. Um, So you mentioned your kind of wider job in communications, uh, an issue um, kind of management as well. So the the company is Oxtail. So can you tell us a bit about that? Um, Well, I I, when I was got into farming, I worked for um, I worked on on farms. Then I went to Canada for a bit, worked on dairy farms, was really interested in cattle breeding came back, worked for an auction business in Scotland, um, doing dairy sales, and then got a chance to work for a breeding, cattle breeding business. And it didn't really work out because I wanted to do lots of um, sire analyst stuff. And I ended up doing their newsletters. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I ended up going on the Guild of Agricultural Journalist course, Mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic. So I I got placed as a PR company. And um, that's, that's when I got into agricultural PR. So I then worked for this company. Um, they offered me a job. I worked for them for four and a half years. And then I saw an opportunity to go into a big mainstream PR company, dealing with lots of issues, management and reputation and stuff like that, working, you know, clients like Gillette and Cadbury and, and companies like that. So it was really, really good because it, although I had the technical farming knowledge, I then had to apply sort of PR outside farming. And then I got a chance to come back and work for the Milk Development Council. And then I decided to set up on my own because um, I just felt there was a way I wanted to do things and the things I wanted to do in the industry and it was the best way of doing it was to do it the way I wanted to do it so I set it up about 10 years ago um uh, 12 years ago and uh, it's been great it's been I worked with some really great people um but I've had the opportunity as well to um do especially over the last five years work on the responsible use of medicines and agriculture alliance work with them in um, tackling the issue of or the perception of antibiotic use in farming and have been able to help communicate what's happening in the industry but also push back against the mistruths and I think what that's shown me really above everything else is that with all these issues we've got coming up like climate change and so on it's not good enough to just push back and say that's not true that's not ours we're different we're not we're not the cause we have to own, we have a shared responsibility to own these issues along with everyone else. And I think we get heard better if we openly take responsibility for our share of the problem. And then that allows us to push back against the stuff that's not our share of the problem. So I think um, I've learned a lot from my time doing this work. And I'm hoping that through my PhD, I can also learn more about, you know, different ways of communicating and how we can keep evolving the industry and improving its standing in the eyes of the public, because we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us at the moment. Because yeah, actually it's, it's quite tricky when you talk about drug use and antibiotic use and, and everything like that. And even if we extended it to to any kind of chemical use in, in arable farming as well, it's a really to to somebody who isn't in the industry. It must be a very daunting thing to think that supposedly we're pumping animals full of chemicals, putting chemicals on the field. But it's a lot more measured than that. There's a reason behind every action almost. So I think you're right. It's a that's a real two-way process to get the understanding there to be honest definitely but I think I think sometimes we don't quite approach it in the right way because our our default position is always push back and say that's not true this is what we do and we have these sort of phrases we always trot out which which you know like people outside the industry can sometimes criticize us you open an open you know a, a newspaper and you'll see that we douse crops with chemicals and we we pump animals full of antibiotics and they always use those words and yet we always use the same words to push back and sort of say you know we have the highest welfare standards in the world and all that kind of thing which which may be true but it's like we're just stuck in this polarized kind of position where we say one thing and other people say the other so we have to change that dynamic yeah and I think the way we change it is we actually try and engage with people because we've got common problems um but they we, they need to know we take our responsibilities seriously and even if we think we do a good job we're not content with, with sitting there we're always trying to get better we recognize where we're, we need to get better we recognize where we need to make changes and owning that part of the problem really is disarming to people if they realize that 
you, you're accountable and you own your issues, suddenly they're more interested in hearing about what you're doing and more sympathetic towards you. And I think that's what we probably need to change because at the moment we're just sort of locking horns yeah. with people. And um, so owning our share of the responsibility, facing up to what we need to do is I think one of the key things I'd like to see us sort of change in the narrative a little bit, because I think that will help us go a long way to getting more sympathy externally. I think one thing we've kind of been throwing around um, during this conversation is this idea of welfare. The, you know the term welfare it is a huge thing um so I guess what does welfare really mean from your perspective and also in your research we've we keep talking about these um misconceptions and consumers perspective but what have you found to be the biggest misconceptions what have you found in your research what are you looking at specifically well I mean the one thing which I think people outside of farming don't realize is actually most farmers with animals, they love working with animals and they work with animals because they love working with animals. So I think that's one thing which I think people struggle to reconcile the fact that you can make a living out of. They see it as exploiting animals, but we make a living out of rearing animals and looking after animals yeah. and then we hope they have a good life and a good death. And that's how it works. Um, so I think that's one misconception, I think, is that people can't struggle to reconcile the two. One really, really interesting thing I found through my research is, is about how we all perceive welfare differently. So there's um, some really, really good research which, which agrees on the fact that um, researchers and scientists see, they measure welfare as in sort of outcome, biological parameters. So they'll measure um, outcomes and they'll measure measure things so they'll say that's what good welfare is is they have all these biological signs farmers tend to measure welfare by um by health and the care they put into the animal whereas the public see welfare as, as through icons like they don't understand the animal science so they use icons like straw and space and access to pasture and that's that's how they measure welfare so you can see that if we all see welfare differently, how on earth are we going to agree on what good welfare is? Because we yeah. all use different measures to, 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 to understand it. So I think that's one of the things I'm trying to do is to bring us closer together, because I think we need to probably better understand how the public perceive welfare. And I think one of the big challenges we've got is how do we make people feel good about their choices to consume animal products? Yeah. And that has to be that they feel there's good welfare. And even though we might not like listening to people sometimes we say I don't like being told how to farm by people who don't know how to farm and I completely get that but we are where we are and if we're going to move this debate forward we might have to listen a little bit more and think about how we can make people feel good about choosing our products mm -hmm. um, so how do we do that so I think it's about a bit of a change of mindset and maybe seeing um, rather than there being lots of steps between us and the customer is thinking mm -hmm. I need to farm in a way that actually people make people feel good about buying my products rather than buying that dairy alternative or that that vegan product because I think we've got a lot to talk about in terms of um, wholesomeness I mean that we have the most wholesome products they're not processed they're not overly processed they are complete nutritional products they're really high value nutritional products so all the sort of highly processed vegan stuff that's coming onto the market we've got a real positive story to tell that if we can just help people feel good about choosing so they feel yeah. good about the environmental impact they feel good about the welfare and to do that, we need to understand how they see those things and what how they measure it. Do we then need to be putting more kind of, I, I don't want to say, responsibility on maybe supermarkets? Do we need to be labelling things better? I know for a fact, obviously, um, going into the supermarket and buying eggs, for instance, I can differentiate between free range, organic um, barn eggs. But in saying that, I come from a poultry background so, you know, I, before I was in poultry, I didn't realise what free range actually meant. So maybe we need better labelling on um, dairy products, on meat products. Do we, I mean, I'd love to see supermarkets have a board where it just has different icons to show what different labels mean, like what they really mean. You know, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's a difficult one. I mean, uh, look, with the antibiotic issue, to me, I could see we were going to get targets. We were going to get targets to reduce antibiotic use and that was coming so rather than having them imposed on us I felt it was really important that the industry actually decided to set its own targets so it could set meaningful targets that it actually understood and could make a difference mm -hmm. I feel the same with labeling and I've got into lots of arguments with people about it but I think labeling is coming 
And so do we want to allow campaign groups to use the icons of pasture and straw and stuff mm -hmm. um, to dictate labelling? Or do we want to actually take some responsibility for it? And I, I know there's a big labelling consultation out at the moment and things are, are moving on. I think in terms of dairy farming, it's really hard because um, because you don't just have free range barn and yeah, and exactly. Cage. You have a whole range of different systems. So, and I think as well is um, what's really really important is we cannot allow um, public preferences like I like my dairy cows to be outside to be mixed up with welfare because they're two different things, and you could have poor welfare in cows that go outside you could have fantastic welfare in cows that are inside so I think in a way that's what worries me is I think we should take more control possibly we should accept that these things are coming and maybe people want them uh, but only by engaging and actually saying what we think will work will we be able to have some control over it and that's my worry is I think for so long so many times we we push back and we get into siege mentality um, and instead of actually turning around and facing the issue and saying, OK, this this is a direction of travel. This is coming. People need confidence. So how are we going to do this in a way that's meaningful and fair to farmers? Um, and we've done that with antibiotics. We, we've actually done that. I think we should be doing that more with climate change. Um, and I think we should be doing that with labelling. But then I, that's my view. And I know it's not everyone else's. No, I think that's really interesting because I, 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 I totally understand where you're coming from in the sense of, you know, we need to look at it from a, a farmer's perspective and then need more input. And then I do look at it from the consumer perspective. And I think, how many times do I pick up a pint of milk and look to see if it's got a British flag on it? Or, you know, is that just becoming kind of expected now? Do I really look for the British flag anymore? You know, you, you mentioned about, um, you know, options for vegans and vegetarians and this kind of really great story behind it of saving the planet and, um, ethical issues and again I really um, you know I'm happy for anybody to choose their own path as long as they know um, they're making a decision on facts mm. and I'm thinking to some degree I think you do need the kind of consumer's perspective for, for labels um, but then again do you, it's just so difficult because do you want to like pick up cheese and see five different labels to suggest if it's a certain thing do we need just need do we just need a criteria that has like um you, you know you've got rspca assured do you almost need something like that which is like welfare assured or but that is from a farming perspective i don't know what do you think bex <laughs> i think it's a really i think it's a really really difficult one but i really amy the point you made about you could have cows which are outside and the welfare is very very low and I think that is a message which sums up almost, yeah. it, and we've said it before, it's not ignorance, it's a lack of understanding from the public. Oh, it's not because they don't want to, sometimes the information's not there, it's not easy to get to. But I think that's a massive distinction in that if we help the public to understand why cows inside actually might be living a better life than cows outside, that that's a barrier we need to break down and make it easy. Tell people, tell people why, listen to their, their reasons why they don't maybe agree with it or whatever, and then come to some middle ground where we're not at each other's throats and we're not trying to, as you say, have a real extreme of perspectives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some middle ground where you can have a good understanding. So we did an episode in our first series um, with um, a poultry manager um, and a vegetarian, and it's... It was a real interesting kind of experience yeah. because we, we weren't pitting them against each other. They just came to a middle ground where we're like, well, as a consumer, I like this a bit. And as a poultry manager, maybe I need to do a bit more on that. Or And we, we hit a real good middle ground on that episode, I think. Mm -hmm. And maybe that needs to be transposed into the wider industry of hitting a middle ground of understanding. I think so. And I mean, wh wh why couldn't I mean, I know there's discussions around welfare labelling and I think you could agree some outcomes you could say you know is the cow this is the cow that um you know are, are certain bars met you know, does it fall into low medium or high and then a bit like nutritional label um you could have like a mm -hmm. disc with different colors on it for different welfare outcomes and then you could have completely separately you know maybe how the animal was um, reared and then how the animal was slaughtered i know it's a lot of labeling but if people feel very strongly about it you know 
you just need to separate them out because they're different. They're different. And um, I mean, there is an argument to say method of slaughter could be um, rolled into welfare. But again, you know, there's evidence to say that that if if religious non stand slaughter is done right, um, it, it could be better for welfare than stunning done wrong. So, you know, that again, it's about the how um, rather than the, the, you know, they say it's not about the how than the cow, it's about the how, not the, not the what. And I think that's, we have to, only we can actually have an impact on how this comes out if we engage with it. If we just keep fighting it, we can yeah. spend all our energy fighting on a binary of should we, shouldn't we, instead of just saying, let's get into this let's engage let's work out what we need to do um because this is the direction of travel and i think that's what we sometimes just don't always kind of spot in farming is where the direction travel is going where the public sentiment's going where our customers are going and what we're going to need to do to take control of that argument and that's where we end up handing over control to to what animal welfare charities and campaign groups who want other things but they use all our issues like antibiotic use they use our antibiotic issue to try and um, eliminate um, certain farming systems so they can have animals just farmed the way they want you know so this is the problem is we end up losing control if we don't engage and actually think the writing's on the wall how are we going to take control of this issue yeah because actually if we farmed in what probably the public think is the most welfare friendly way it probably means a handful of cows in the biggest wow. field ever and actually the problem with that is we then lose sight of the fact that we're producing food which yeah. we absolutely need so it's a real real and it costs a lot and, and it'll cost yeah. a lot to, and they won't want yeah. to pay that so you know it's and i know i've been in the supermarket where there's been a you know a, a pack of chicken for 450 and a pack of chicken for nine pounds and I'm going to go for the 450 even though I know um that if I had if if all things being equal I would probably go for the nine pound one because it it rests my conscience slightly easier but I know that the four pound fifty one is being produced perfectly reasonably um but yeah it's it's cost is a big factor to everybody yeah definitely definitely so we're coming to our final question which we do ask all of our guests um, I am obviously the boots of our duo, much of her being in my wellies. Um, Lizzie heels, although we have got her in wellies a few times, haven't we? Lizzie? I know, and look at the earrings, guys. <laughs> um, so would you say your team boots or team heels? Now, I'm not, I can't work this one out because I feel like it could be a combina combination of both, ah. living in the farm and a bit of behind the scenes work as well. Oh, well, you see, I think, I don't, I think I do fall between two camps. I would say boots mainly and I have to say after years and years of wearing um cheap wellies I'm now firmly of the view that you need to have posh French wellies because they're the most <laughs> comfortable but also I think that if you wear the right boots it then gives you a chance to occasionally wear the right heels as well so there you go you're absolutely right perfect <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us today Amy <laughs> but thank you very much for the opportunity no brilliant thank you right Cheers. bye guys so thank you very much to Amy for that episode. I think you'll agree we touched on some quite interesting topics, topics which are really important for the future of farming. I think from a farming perspective myself, maybe we do need to put the shoe or, or boot on the other foot um, sometimes and see things from the consumer's perspective more. Yeah, I also thought, I think it was really interesting about the labelling side of things. So as always, I would love it if anybody listening or watching this could send us a message. What are your views on labels? What do you think? Do you think we should be putting more on there? Should it be um, responsibility of the consumer, the farmer, the supermarket? Give us a shout. We want to hear from you. So thanks again for joining us. As always, you can find us on Boots and Heels UK. And you can also send us a message and get the next episode saturday 9 a.m next week thanks again for joining us i'm lizzie i'm becca and you're listening to boots and heels bye